10 minutes here. All right, welcome into the new Port This Week video podcast series. I'm Bill Bartholomew, a great pleasure to spend some time with you always here on this hyper-local podcast series as we dig into all kinds of aspects of our community, including what is, quite frankly, not just the future, but it's the present right now. And Paul, I, I guess the best thing to do uh, since we're on somewhat limited time, is if you want to introduce yourself and explain the work that you do, and then we can get into some of the impact that it's having. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I my name is Paul Lewin. I'm the CEO of Havoc AI. We're a local Rhode Island company, and we're building uh, scalable maritime autonomy. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, uh, just because it ties into you know why Havoc uh, and why we're mission focused here. So I'm originally a refugee from Myanmar. I came here uh, when I was 10, uh, and that kind of drove me to want to continue to solve and give back uh, for you know all the things the uh, United States has given me. And so I went to the Naval Academy, uh, flew uh, prowlers there over Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and then got involved in uh, defense tech. Uh, and one of the reasons we started Havoc AI is you know because the DoD customer is clearly asking uh, companies to build thousands of these uh, uh, and cruise surface vessels. Uh, and right now, I don't think our competitors can meet those challenges. So in January, we decided to start this. Uh, we knew that being in Rhode Island, uh, we have access to you know all the boat builders here, right? There are generations of boat builders. Uh, and what we didn't need to do was to design a boat from scratch. And like our competitors who have to do this, so we reached out to uh, boat builders in the area, found one specifically that we really like to work with. And that really helped us uh, to move fast, right? So since January, we built 12 USBs, uh, you know, using very limited funding. Uh, we have more boats than we have people. Uh, and we took it to a DOD exercise uh, and blew them away, right? Uh, basically, you know, uh, scalable maritime autonomy is here, right? It's not two, three years downrange. It's here because of our work in Rhode Island and because of the ecosystem we have in Rhode Island. So I appreciate your time. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it is part of a theme that oftentimes gets very much centralized around offshore wind, uh, maybe somewhat fisheries. And that is the um, the blue economy. I mean, the blue economy is really the the driving force in so many ways of what we're trying to do here in Rhode Island, economic development wise going forward. We have a long history of defense. We have a lot of, of defense projects. And as you said, boat building, you can frankly trace that back to indigenous times, the blue economy yeah. as a whole. So what sort of support when when this idea started to become uh, realistic and you've started to see the type of growth that you've had at Havoc, what sort of support have you had from uh, local officials, state officials, federal officials in terms of getting your vision to the next level, scaling up that scalable uh, project? You know, uh, we've had tremendous support uh, from the beginning, right? You know, I think everyone is really tapped into uh, what's happening in the plants tech right now, but even more so in ocean tech, right? I know, you know, with uh, uh, everything that's going on, it's very important uh, to uh, monitor our waterways, you know, and uh, right now we're using uh, crude vessels, right? Whether it's boats or uh, helicopters and things like that, uh, offshore to monitor a lot of these areas that, you know, things like ours, you can do it at a more affordable price point, which means we can monitor them more efficiently and more real time, right? Uh, and make decisions uh, that allow uh, us to really uh, uh, understand what's going on out there. You know, just today, we've got five boats on the uh, Providence River, and we had the Army Corps of Engineer who was solving the channel out here stop by uh, to see the USVs, and they were like, wait, we want these, we need these, because that would make our life so much easier. Right to monitor the channel out there, so I think uh, there's tremendous both both from uh, you know the local province area, from the Rhode Island state area, and all all, all the way to federal, right, both uh, Capitol Hill and uh, the DoD. It's interesting because we think of this in the context of defense, which it is. It certainly is something that is relevant to national security and global partnerships, and we certainly see on piloted aerial drones as a big part of defense strategies and offensive strategies as well. And that's undoubtedly a piece of what you're working on. How much is the work that you're doing also tied to things like Smart Bay, monitoring yeah. our water for both uh, environmental reasons and for climate change reasons and just sort of measuring fisheries, things like this? Is this broader than just defense? 
It is broader, right? Well, dual use company, uh, obviously defense is relevant in the times we live right now, but overall, you know, we want to do this uh, for the commercial market too, because you just hit on all of those use cases, right? Currently, think it's like the smart project, uh, they, they don't have access to affordable USBs, right? So that's why they can't use it because when, you know, your USB costs in the 500 to 1.5 million, like our competitors does, you can't buy a lot of them. And you know, even the Narragansett pay is large, right? You can't do two USBs. You're probably going to need, you know, 50 to 100 of them. And that's what we bring to the game. So IBM uh, caught wind of what we were doing and has kept us in the loop about smart pay. Uh, and we'll do some demonstrations with them at the end of this month uh, to kind of uh, uh, monitor the Narragansett pay using 12 of our boats. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine, you know, before they were doing this with like one, one large boat, uh, crude boat, uh, and going around taking weeks to survey the whole area. We're going to do that, you know, in the matter of hours, right? And that's what uh, scalable mass gives you, right? Distribution, ability to sense. Uh, and quite honestly, it's the same use case between DOD and the commercial, right? You need these things to be out on the water and you need some kind of sensors on them. And that's where the difference is, right? DOD is going to uh, need different sensors than the commercial customer, but we can provide that, right? And we can lead these boats all the way uh, to, you know, weeks to months out there doing their mission uh, more affordably, exponentially uh, cheaper, uh, more affordable than the uh, what the current platforms are doing. Right. One other thing with any tech project, it always is a question of, of relevance of the actual product that you're working on and modifications and new versions as you move forward. I think something that we're starting to talk about more with offshore wind, and we've seen some some problems in, in some of the, in the vineyard wind where a turbine broke off and we're starting to, there's more questions being asked, not just by maniacs who are opposed to offshore wind entirely, but, <laughs> but people who, you know, have a more of a sober view about obsolescence. So how much of your work right now is about meeting this moment because we're in it as we speak, but also looking 5, 10, 20 years down the line to stay ahead of the curve so that the contracts that you have, the work that you're doing in defense, which can be translated into the commercial sector, is still relevant and leading the pack in terms of the industry down the line. Yeah, and that's why dual use is very important, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, uh, you know, not obvious, uh, own, you know, obviously the uh, national security is extremely important. Uh, but it also provides a customer that you can use to uh, kind of offset some of the changes in the commercial market that you're talking about, right? Uh, so, you know, who knows, you know, what what's uh, going to happen to the offshore industry, but monitoring the ocean is something we always have to do, right? Uh, and, you know, whether or not uh, you believe in climate change or not, you, we need to monitor the oceans, right? Uh, especially because things are changing, we're seeing uh, you know, this uh, every day on the news, right? Uh, and the only way to realistically monitor uh, large ocean areas is to deploy tens of thousands of these assets. Uh, and so we think you're always going to need these, uh, especially going uh, into the future. Uh, and we can deploy any kind of sensors you need uh, affordably, right? So we can really figure out what is going you know, on in the oceans and how we, you know, fix some of the issues that we find. So that that's what a dual use strategy gives us, right? And uh, the DOD is always going to need uh, and cruise of its vessels, uh, just because we've been doing this transition for a long time, right? And events in Ukraine uh, and the Red Sea has kind of pointed to transitioning from, you know, large expensive ships to more affordable ships that are more, quite honestly, more capable than some of these very expensive assets. Right. And more nimble as well in environments nimble, yeah. that are becoming much less. I mean, I'm certainly not someone qualified to speak on national security, but I've interviewed a lot of people uh, who are. And, you know, one theme that you hear right now is that this isn't the era of the post World War Two type of military anymore, even though there are elements yeah. of the, that mindset in leadership. And we have to get to a point where we can be a lot more surgical and a lot more nimble in our national and security and broadly speaking in our defense. You're working on that. It's an incredible project. Uh, last question, how can more people, or uh, pardon me, how can anyone who wants more information about what you're doing um, and learn more about your your work do so? Yeah, you can always reach out to us uh, you know, on HavocAI.com uh, and then there's uh, an email address there. Uh, we, you know, we, uh, we really want to play very nicely as part of the Rhode Island community, right? Honestly, we couldn't have built our boats anywhere else. It is the 
the Rhode Island boat building industry and everything else here uh, that has uh, enabled the boss to move as fast as we can, right? If you yeah. just think about it, in six months, we did uh, what none of our competitors with hundreds of millions of dollars. It took them years to do this. And we're able to do this because, you know, Rhode Island and bigger New England industry, right? Uh, we have a lot of engineering knowledge here. So we're always looking for uh, great teammates uh, to join us, but also just, you know, everyone to get involved, right? All the way, you know, uh, the War College, the Naval War College is here, right? That's where the strategy for the next, you know, 5, 10, 20 years is being executed. We have boats, right? We can play nicely with them. Most of our team is all veterans here. And those are the kind of relationships that we're looking to extend uh, because I think, you know, it's beneficial to us. It's beneficial to, you know, the uh, the students going through the war college there. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, you can reach out to us uh, through those means. Obviously on LinkedIn, uh, or, uh, I'm sure we'll see most of our videos that we're putting out. Awesome. Thanks so much, Paul. Yeah. Thank you so much, man.